Well, good evening. My name is Ronald Weich, and I'm the Dean at the University of Baltimore School of Law. I want to welcome all of our guests to this third installment in our UB Law in Focus discussion series. We are very excited to be offering this series of webinars that examines current issues through a legal lens, and we tap our very accomplished faculty members and alumni to participate in these conversations. So today's webinar is entitled Voting Rights Under Threat. Will there be a free and fair election in November? This topic could hardly be more timely because we're in an election year and this is uh, the time to focus on this most fundamental right. So we'll call in our three UB experts whom I will introduce shortly to shed light on various legal controversies swirling around the right to vote. Now these discussions are meant to be interactive. We're, we're, we're proud to include you. So uh, we thank you for joining us and we invite you to pose questions to our panel using the Q&A function of Zoom. You know, there's a chat function and a Q&A function. I encourage you to use the Q&A function um, uh, to, uh, to ask your questions. Um, before we get started, let me briefly tell you about our next webinar. We think it'll be very interesting. It's entitled Redlining Today, How and Why Race Matters for Access to Wealth in Baltimore. That will take place on Tuesday, July 14th, from also from 5 to 6 p.m. Um, and that is one of several uh, webinars that's going to be on the topic of structural racism. Uh, so that topic, we're going to have three UB law professors, experts in the field, Cassandra Jones Havard, Jamie Lee, and Audrey McFarlane. Uh, you'll find registration info, info for that webinar on the alumni page of the University of Baltimore School of Law website, as well as in the website's events calendar. And now for this evening's presentation. Voting rights under threat. Will there be a free and fair election in November? Our three experts are UB Law Professor Gilda Daniels, who teaches civil procedure, civil rights law, and election law at UB. Gilda is Director of Litigation for the Advancements Project. And earlier this year, she published a very important book entitled Uncounted, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America. We're also joined by another UB Law Professor, Kim Whaley, teaches many subjects at UB Law. And just yesterday, she celebrated publication of her new book entitled, What You Need to Know About Voting and Why. We also have with us UB alumna, Jennifer Wachuku, who graduated in 2015 and now works on voting rights litigation and election protection efforts as counsel to the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. And this is um, a bit of a reunion because uh, Jennifer, uh, I wanna put something up on the screen so you all see it. Um, we have, uh, the covers of our two professors' books. But Jennifer, when she was at UB, was a research assistant for Professor Daniel. So this is something of a reunion. Um, and we're very glad to welcome Jennifer back to the school for this important discussion. Now, before we talk about voting, we're gonna turn to the headlines because just today, the Supreme Court decided a very important decision involving the uh, uh, immigration policy, the deferred action for uh, childhood arrivals. And it's actually an administrative law decision. And fortunately, we have one of our administrative law experts, Professor Whaley, uh, with us today. And I'd ask her to just tell us what the Supreme Court did today. What was this all about? Kim? Oops. I'm not hearing Kim, but... Um... So you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, uh, so what the Supreme Court did today was basically strike down the Trump administration's decision to stop the DACA program. So what the DACA program did was say, for people that are born in the United States, they can stay in the United States, um, notwithstanding the existing immigration laws. And essentially what that is, is a decision by uh, President Obama at the time to not enforce immigration laws against that category of people. And that is technically within the power of the president to stay, decide, I'm not going to prosecute this case. I'm not going to prosecute that case. That's squarely within the power of the president. But what the, or, what the decision did in addition was gives benefits to these people. And that's what took it out of pure executive power. Why it's an administrative law decision is that this wasn't done by Congress. It wasn't done through a notice and comment rulemaking. It was done through essentially a memo, uh, which in administrative law we call a non-legislative rule. 
So in came President Trump. President Trump said, um, I don't want this. And so he reversed it. He basically stopped the program. And so the question before the court was, if it's okay for Obama to have done that program, is it okay for Trump to have taken that program away? And essentially what the majority did in an opinion written by the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, was said, say, uh, decide, you know, it's okay that they withdrew it, that the President Trump withdrew it, drew it, but had to give better reasons. It's the same rationale really that we saw when the Trump administration's attempt uh, through the Department of Commerce to add a citizenship question to the U.S. Census was struck down by the Supreme Court. They're just saying, listen, if you're going to do something like this, you have to give good reasons. In particular, there are a lot of people that are relying on this program, and there wasn't enough rationale in the decision to re re reverse DACA uh, to give reasons why these people should suffer. Now, we had two dissenting opinions, which you might want to ask about, uh, uh, Ron. One was uh, written by Justice Thomas. And then we saw Brett Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh, once again, like he did also this week in the decision construing the Civil Rights Act and the re uh, meaning of the word sex, write his own standalone dissenting opinion disagreeing with the majority. There's so much we could talk about here, but I want to get to voting. But I just want to ask you this. It seems so interesting that Chief Justice Roberts writes this. He was with the majority in the uh, uh, civil rights case earlier this week, as you say, the LGBT rights case. Um, he was, as you said, on the census case. He struck down the census question. And in the first webinar that we had in this series, we spoke about his opinion in uh, the case that uh, upheld the California governor's public health restrictions against a challenge from a church. Um, so is Roberts turning into a liberal or is he? A <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> well, I mean, I think he's, I think he is as predicted by many becoming the new swing vote on the court now that Justice Kennedy is no longer there. There's pressure on his shoulders particularly as the Chief Justice, to not only um, obviously make call balls and strikes in these very ambiguous cases, very rarely are they black and white and clear cut. And I think that surprises a lot of people who believe the Constitution is so clear. It's not. It's old and there's a lot of ambiguity and the same thing with statutes. But the, the, the Chief Justice is in this unique role where he has to preserve the legitimacy of the court itself, the belief amongst all Americans. And remember, um, just uh, Justice Kavanaugh was put on the court with a slim, slim majority. So, which means uh, there are a lot of Americans that didn't, didn't, didn't feel good about or buy into that appointment. So, I think he is trying not to, to not to reinforce this notion that there are political justices on one side and political justices on the other side, and ha try to. Uh, enforce um, the the important institutional perception of the court as an independent body, not one that's controlled by the two major parties in the United States. Very, very interesting. Gilda's going to tell us, though, that in uh, uh, the Shelby County case and in other race cases, he has been a more traditional conservative justice and, and not a friend of. of and we can anticipate that he will continue to do that. I think this is yeah. an opportunity. This, what, what I think what we've seen certainly in this this week is that he's trying to establish it as his court, as the Roberts Court, certainly with uh, Justice, Justice Kennedy's retirement, where, where Justice Kennedy was served as the person who was bridging the gap between the two, certainly between the Republicans and the uh, political uh, appointee, appointees, app appointed justices. But now I think he's trying to establish that this is certainly his court. Very interesting. I think yeah. that space. Well, let me add too, if I could, Ron, I mean, we saw during the Obama administration, I think a lot of upset and understandable upset around uh, Mitch McConnell, Senate Majority Leader's refusal to, to allow Merrick Garland, uh, uh, President Obama's pick for the Supreme Court to even get a hearing in the Senate, which arguably really was in violation of the Appointments Clause because there was no such power for the Senate Majority Leader to take that away from President Obama. That being said, after all that hullabaloo, uh, at the end of the day, uh, We've seen, we saw today, and we saw with a case the other day, a lineup we might have seen uh, with a Justice Kennedy instead of a Justice, or excuse me, with a Justice, uh, with Justice Gorsuch that we would have seen had President Obama gotten his his pick as well. That Justice uh, uh, Kavanaugh stepped into the traditional shoes of Justice Scalia, and Gorsuch is an independent thinker uh, and, a, and somewhat moderate in the same way that uh, Judge Garland might have been. Well, let's stay tuned as the, as the court's jurisprudence continues to develop. But now let's turn to voting. That's what brings us here. And I'd like to ask each of the panelists, why uh, is voting important? Let's get to basics. I'm going to start with Gilda, and then Jennifer, and then Kim, 
Um, Gilded, what, why should we regard voting as a fundamental right? Why is it so important? Right, for many of the reasons we've already discussed, right, and even in the few minutes that we've started this discussion, certainly who gets to pick the Supreme Court justices is very important. And, uh, who, and who's elected as the president it, it certainly uh, is, is, a, is a very important reason. Uh, but it, the, 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 the vote is our voice. Uh, voice it is certainly the voice of the people and it's an opportunity to determine our representatives uh, and, and who gets selected for very important positions like the Supreme Court. Uh, and we, we know that voting is the linchpin and a very critical part of our, of, of our democracy. And when it is not operating correctly, <laughs> Uh, and uh, then we are certainly operating in a, in a state of, of crisis. And I've certainly spent the, more than two decades in trying to ensure that people have the opportunity to participate freely and fairly in that, in that process. And we now, want- I'm sure I said in my introduction to you, Gilda, that you work at the Justice Department in the voting rights section of the Civil Rights Division. So you have been spending decades on this. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. So let me just turn to Jennifer. Jennifer, how interesting that you leave UB um, out into the world, we launched you. And you found your way to this important issue of, of uh, advocacy and, and litigation with respect to voting. Why did you choose that path? Well, honestly, I have to give my kudos to uh, Professor Daniels, having the opportunity to work with her as a research assistant, especially right after uh, Shelby County versus Holder um, in 2013, really kind of helped me understand how significant voting is and really understanding you know, that there were states that were essentially waiting in the wings for the Shelby County decision to drop. And then we saw as soon as the opinion came down, the, the changes that states were making immediately. Um, so it was very clear to me at that point that, you know, voting is a, a crucial and, and fundamental issue. Um, I think in terms of, you know, bringing it um, to today and literally what we're seeing with protests that are taking place um, in support of uh, Black Lives Matter, um, and, and thinking about how we address uh, structural institutional racism. Um, you know, our, our local elections matter. Uh, we talk a lot in the voting rights world about down ballot uh, voting. So not just your federal elections, but also your state and local elections. When we're having conversations about what it means to defund the police, what that looks like, those are decisions that are made by your uh, state officials, by your city council. Um, so when we're thinking about what we want our uh, society to look like at the most granular level, um, you know, voting plays a very fundamental role in what our, our, our world looks like. Well said, a direct line from the ballot, uh, from, from the voting booth, whether it's a real booth or a, or a to, uh, to policy. Well Absolutely. Said. And why did you decide, you just, you know, it seems like just yesterday you published a book about how to read the Constitution, and your very next book is about voting. Why did you choose that as your topic? Why? It, because the, because it's the natural progression to studying what the traditional checks and balances are in the government, um, which, of course, is uh, Congress and the courts when it comes to the presidency, and what we've seen Sorry, my dog is <laughs> not feeling so well. Um, uh, I have like a baby I, I've been walking around with lately. So uh, forgive me for that. But, um, but, you know, I did write the book on the Constitution and I did a lot of analysis on the impeachment process. And at the end of the day, we have a Congress that's not functioning anymore um, to actually do its constitutional prerogative and uh, obligation to oversee the office of the presidency, not just this president. And that is, we, we, you know, it's hard to do oversight without uh, subpoena power that's enforceable. Uh, it's, uh, if you have appropriations that get ignored and there's no consequence, the appropriations doesn't cl clause doesn't work anymore. If you have private attorneys and sons-in-laws uh, carrying out foreign policy and important pandemic related policy without going through the advice and consent process, then the advice and consent clause isn't working anymore. If you've got an internal justice department that answers to the president, that takes the position that presidents as a matter of constitutional law cannot be prosecuted, that's not in the constitution, it's not in a Supreme Court decision, it's not in a statute, but that knocks out the judicial branch. So we really are, and I, I mean, this could sound like hyperbole to some, but I think what's on the ballot this particular November um, given what we've seen with the George Floyd First Amendment protests being ha like hammered so badly uh, by the federal government, peaceful protests, you know, rubber bullets, uh, um, tear gas, media, members of the media, the 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 First Amendment uh, 
you know, have expressed rights in the First Amendment, just being silenced by virtue of challenging this, this administration, uh, what is on the ballot in November is uh, a democracy itself. I mean, Absolutely. I think people need to go out and vote yeah. for an accountable government or, you know, if you're okay with the slip into authoritarianism, then uh, you can vote that way or not vote at all. But if you want to preserve it for yourself and your children who can't vote right now because they're not old enough, uh, then I think it's incumbent on every single American, even with the voter suppression elements that are in place that I know Gilda's going to talk about and others, yes. uh, it's incumbent on everyone, every American to take this on their own and fight for their rights yeah. in this moment. So we'll say, it, we'll say it now, we'll say it at the end, November 3rd is election day. Let's remind people, Tuesday, November 3rd. What you might want to do is silence yourself, mute yourself. I will. I will. I'm actually. Yeah. And then we'll call, when I call on you, you'll unmute yourself. But Gilda, let me um, turn to you and ask about this November. How we're in the middle of a pandemic still. I know some of the, in some places the cases are going down and other cases they're going up. Um, how are Americans going to vote um, this November in the middle of this public health emergency? Um, <laughs> I, I also want to, I want to, before I get to that, I want to talk about something sure. that um, Kim mentioned. And I think I want to stress that this is that, you know, what we're, what we're talking about is more than politics, right? There's a difference between voting rights and politics. There's sure. a difference between voting rights and election law even. So uh, certainly it, what I've been working on in the last more than two decades is certainly making sure that everyone has the right to vote and has that, and has that right free of discrimination. Uh, and regardless of who people choose to vote for, making sure that they can get to the ballot box and, or, or that they can register and that they can actually cast a ballot. Mm -hmm. Now, how are people going to vote in this uh, November? I think it's also important to note that there are, there are some, for example, in places like Florida, there are state elections in August, right? And as well as the uh, presidential um, election in uh, November. So I think we have to, so when we're talking about the right to vote and having people, people having access to the right to vote, we gotta have to look at the, essentially the act of voting. And certainly we are seeing that um, people are recognizing the importance of uh, voting in every election, right? Mm -hmm. For example, in Florida, one of the things that's on the ballot is sheriffs and uh, their county attorneys. Uh, in August. So if you, you know, Florida is where Trayvon Martin happened, right? And so if you want to, you want to elect, you know, sheriffs who are responsive, you know, representative, you want to elect county attorneys who get to determine what the charges are going to be against uh, a, uh, someone who commits those hideous uh, acts, then those are, you know, then we need to participate in those elections. Voting in the, in the election uh, during this pandemic, has certainly changed. We saw that in, in, in the, for the presidential preference primaries uh, in places like Florida and Wisconsin and even Georgia a, few, a, a week or so ago, right? Changes that um, some secretaries of states uh, made in, 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 many, in, in many instances because they thought it would make the process easier actually made it more difficult. For well, it seems like some, some uh, governors and, and, and others or election officials are uh, relying on mail-in voting. Mm -hmm. uh, was certainly the case here in Maryland, um, but um, that isn't at all a, a you know, fail-safe mechanism. You've written in your book uh, that there are lots of communities that uh, don't um, use that process well. The question of whether the Postal Service is going to be undermined by uh, you know, budget cuts. Um, are you concerned that mail-in balloting will be unreliable? Gilda? No, I mean, there, there's, there are five states that have been, that have been using uh, vote by mail uh, exclusively, right? Uh, places like Colorado that have been using it and, have, and, and have, have, have higher voter turnout than places that, only, that, that primarily use in-person in -person voting. Mm -hmm. I am uh, not concerned that um, vote by mail is going to cause problems. What I am concerned about is that the, the, the jurisdictions are not doing the work on the front end to ensure that uh, that, that they can alleviate that they can alleviate those problems and uh, vote by mail should is not is not the only answer I think it is one of many things that jurisdictions should be doing to ensure that people have a multiplicity of ways that they can actually uh, cast a ballot in, in at in least some places. polling places polling places open for people who for one reason or another didn't Absolutely. access the mail um, the lawyers committee is involved in litigation um, to ensure that the right to vote is, uh, is, is made real. Where are you litigating? What kind of cases? 
we are litigating all over the country. Um, to be honest, um, we have um, cases that we filed in Tennessee, um, in Kentucky, in Ohio, um, cases that we have filed in California recently, Georgia. Um, matters that we are um, working on in Arizona as well, um, trying to address uh, voter registration issues um, under the NVRA. Um, and, you know, there are a number of states where their uh, legislatures are currently in session. Um, so there may be changes to respective states' own voting practices. Um, and so depending on what the uh, state legislatures uh, decide to do and the changes they make um, in preparation for November, um, you know, there will be advocacy that needs to be done by the Lawyers Committee, by Advancement Project, and by a host of other civil rights organizations that are focused on voting rights. Yes. It seems to me that what's coming up in at least some of the states, some of the litigation, is about whether the government should be mailing ballots to everybody who's registered, or, or are you mailing a form by which you request a ballot? Is, should there be that middle stage? Let me ask Kim, um, who's written about this, uh, this aspect, um, do you think it should be that the state mails ballots to everybody who's registered? Well, uh, just to back up a little bit, uh, most states allow mail-in voting for a long time. As Gilda mentioned, there are five that exclusively allow mail-in voting, including the Republican-leading state of Utah. And I say that because when mail-in voting comes up, up often, you hear about this myth and this boogeyman of voter fraud, but it's not been a problem. We know how to do this. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing, though, is most states if you want to vote by mail, you have to qualify for an excuse. So you have to be of a certain age or you have to be uh, living abroad. In all but five states, and that's um, Alabama, Arkansas, Mississippi, Tennessee, and Texas right now, in all but five states, there have been, there's legislation that have expanded the right to vote to uh, an excuse that includes fear of getting sick from COVID. So that's good news. Um, most of, I mean, I haven't actually, it's a good question, Ron, the number of states that have directly mailed ballots versus directly mailed applications um, to, or ballots to registered voters. I have looked at the litigation, however. There are 27 lawsuits pending across the country on various issues, um, and they tend to be either about expanding the right to vote to uh, include COVID, uh, as a matter of the 14th Amendment, except, uh, saying, listen, it's important to bring more people under the tent. There are those that go the other way and say, okay, if you're going to do that, then you have to have uh, strict notary public or, uh, signage requirements, which of course kind of defeats the purpose if you have to go to a bank, hire a notary public, go to the UPS store to mail your ballot. That's not exactly helpful. Um, and so those are the lawsuits that are, are ongoing. But in this moment, there are only five states that you would presumably, including Texas, that's just appealed uh, the question of whether COVID-related uh, issues are an excuse for mail-in ballot to the United States Supreme Court. There are only five states where you must go to the polls. Uh, but as, and this is, I should say, some of these states have only expanded it for the, for the primaries. COVID's not going away, so presumably it'll, it'll go to the fall. But I think Gilda makes the most important point here, um, which is, you know, we've all had had maybe had a big party or had planned a wedding reception, you have RSVP so you know how much food to order and how many drinks to order. And these, these states, particularly the ones that aren't used to doing exclusively or primarily mail-in ballots, don't have the infrastructure in place right now. You've got to order these from third parties on certain paper. They have to be printed in multiple languages. And what we saw in Wisconsin, for example, was massive voter turnout. People really wanted to vote. Yes. by mail, but it was just too late by the time they put their applications in and the United States Supreme Court wouldn't allow more time to actually process those votes. So mm -hmm. 71 confirmed cases of COVID for people that physically went to the polls, put their health at risk so they could exercise their right to vote. So the answer so really is register now, register immediately, get your ballot, your mail-in ballot now. And if you don't use it or you can't use it in time, then plan to go to the polls, right. have a backup exactly. plan. To see how much people value the uh, the, the, uh, the franchise um, that they are lining up, as you say, even under difficult health conditions. And, and one can say there are there are more than hundred there are more than one hundred and seventeen COVID related voting rights cases 
Not um, that many. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of litigation around what kinds yeah. of things states and other and, and localities should be doing. Yeah. Sure that people well, have one thing that I know, one thing that I know the litigation is about that both the Advancements Project and the Lawyers Committee and other groups are working on is to fight various efforts at voter suppression. I mean, the, you know, obstacles that are placed uh, in the way of people who want to vote. So let's talk about a couple of those. What about voter ID laws? I mean, is there something that's uh, uh, still going on around the country, Gilda? Well, uh, yes, of course. Well, so there's certainly, uh, there are there are different levels of voter ID, but, but, but certainly what we've been uh, contesting is restrictive voter ID, where there are only a few forms of identification that are accepted in order to uh, cast a ballot. And those those forms of identification usually include a driver's license, military ID, or a passport, or if you live in places like Texas, it was a gun license, <laughs> you're, you're, <laughs> right? So, but you couldn't use your, your student ID or something of that sort. So mm -hmm. um, in those places, and we're seeing that in places um, like Florida, where Advancement Project has the lawsuit in uh, Florida, uh, that we're going to trial on. It looks like we're, there's going to be a trial trial set for July. Um, that it's that it is it, that in regards to voter registration, because as you know, because of the pandemic, most of uh, voter registration outlets have been closed. Right, you can't register at the DMV. You can't register at the registrar of voters or the supervisors of elections in Florida. And so people have been having to do that online and in the the online voter registration capabilities for a number of these states is not built for the number of uh, registrations that they're receiving and for even to, to register online they're requiring the you know the the your driver's uh driver's license id number so for communities that don't have drivers uh driver's licenses they can't even register online Right, so uh, so the, so voter ID requirements are you know showing up in uh, a number of ways uh, pre-election, right? So pre certainly pre-election day. So the the impact of voter ID is still is still is ongoing. I mean, they're, they're seemingly neutral uh, procedures or requirements, but as it plays out, it somehow manages to disadvantage certain communities. Well, it's not somehow because in places like North Carolina, right, right mm -hmm. where they you know, the court said it used surgical precision. They said, huh, how right. many, no. you know, how many black folks right. don't have cards or don't have, a, that's what well, we're going to say you that's a requirement for, uh, for, 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 for actually casting a ballot. So no, it's, no, it's, my, my, my somehow there was meant to be sarcastic. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, um, tell us more about uh, your, your work and, uh, as to fighting these different obstacles. I mean, uh, exact signature matches, purges, are you seeing these different techniques that are getting in the way of the right to vote? Absolutely. Um, we have had a lot of litigation um, that we filed um, in Georgia, um, specifically on a wide range of issues um, related to um, exact math with uh, signature matches, uh, with voter uh, purges. Um, going back to what Professor Daniels mentioned with voter ID um, and how that relates to um, the pandemic. Um, the litigation that we filed in Kentucky also mentioned uh, voter ID because uh, legislation was passed in Kentucky earlier this year uh, requiring voter ID um, in order for folks to be able to vote. Um, and so that was part of our litigation as well for all the reasons um, that Professor Daniels mentioned. Um, so those are just a few, um, few pieces. Uh, we have um, litigation in um, Mississippi um, that I'm working on that's related to uh, absentee ballots um, and, you know, particularly in the context of runoffs, the difficulty for um, individuals to be able to go through the entire um, absentee ballot process, um, which if you are someone who finds out maybe in within two weeks um, that you actually need to cast a ballot absentee, um, you know, it is incredibly difficult, um, if not almost impossible, for you to be able to go through all of the steps, including um, two rounds of uh, not uh, notarization for your absentee ballot application and yeah. your ballot. And you also have to submit your ballot um, to your clerk's office by the day before election day. All so right, there's processes like that, that that make it difficult. To right. Do. Let's let's uh, get our audience involved. We've got some questions. I encourage all audience members to use the Q and A function. 
but uh, most recently we've been asked by an audience member, kind of the threshold question in this area, what's the problem with requiring an ID when voting? In other words, have we gotten past the, uh, fun, the question of whether there can be voter ID laws, and now it's a question of how they're implemented and what uh, identification is permissible. Kim, as a constitutional matter, are voter ID laws allowed? Yeah, because we have a system whereby the individual states are the ones that make the determinations as to how the electoral process works. And essentially, there isn't anything in the original constitution that is an affirmative right to vote. So this is often implemented through the 14th Amendment. So in theory, uh, and statutorily. So in theory, uh, these, these voting limitations cannot be done in a way that discriminates on the basis of a, a protected trait. However, uh, we also have a long history of disenfranchisement in this country. When mm -hmm. the constitution was ratified, only white male landowners could, could actually vote. And the tent was opened over the years after the Civil War to men of color and then to women. Um, but of course, the Civil Rights or the Voting Rights Act in the 1960s was a congressional uh, acknowledgement that voter disenfranchisement of African Americans was a cancer in this country. And that was one of the most successful pieces of legislation in the history of the United States. Um, but the Supreme Court, on technical reasons, basically made it non functional in 2013. And we're seeing. A lot of this again. But I just wanted to say, if you don't mind, um, okay. on the issue of, of IDs, uh, I hear this a lot that, listen, why is it so hard to show an ID? You have to show an ID to get on uh, an airplane. You have to show an ID. Well, actually, to get public benefits, you don't. Um, it depends. Food stamps, you can show some other kind of ID. Gilda mentioned, uh, you know, um, when you're talking about a school ID, that it's not easy to get a school ID and fake a school ID. And the notion is, well, we've got to fight against voter fraud, okay? Voter fraud in, in a study done in 2010, for four years, one billion with a B. Uh, votes were looked at, 31 cases of voter fraud. And that means pretending to be someone you're not. It also carries a five-year prison term under federal law as a felony. And we all know c casting one vote knowingly, fraudulently, is not going to change an election. I don't think people are going to uh, risk their families and their lives going to jail for five minutes or five years over one vote. So, and the, so there are times where legally you're registered in two places and people in theory cast two votes, that's not forbidden under federal law in this moment. If people don't like that, then they should get Congress to amend the law. Um, but but having, having people have to show IDs is not going to address these other problems that really stem from a lack of money, from a lack of training, from a lack of infrastructure, from so many different pieces of the pie. And I think it's just, uh, you know, if you're if you are a, a single mom that has multiple jobs um, and, you know, and a very stretched budget, which we're seeing particularly with COVID and this economic crisis, and you have to go through all these hoops, pay money to get your birth certificate and all these things to prove who you are, to get an ID to then register to vote, to be able to exercise your right to vote, you're not going to do it. If you've got resources, it'll be easier. Remember, okay. we are an opt-in system, not we are not an opt-out system. Other democracies, you're born, you get an ID, you're registered. Here you right. have to prove that you are fact, entitled to vote. That right is there. very different from other constitutional rights in this country. In some countries, in some countries voting is mandatory, right? Australia and Well, it's mandatory, uh, sure, and, and, and you, can get a, you can be fined, and that's partly why, but it's also very easy. And, you know, we, right. we conduct our... our, our um, banking on our telephones. We know how to do this in a way that's safe. And if so, safety is the question and lack of fraud, we know how to do that. Uh, but we're not, we're not taking steps to do that. Okay, so let me get back. You mentioned the Voting Rights Act and Gilda's uh, a national expert on that. Um, Gilda, tell us uh, what the Voting Rights Act was meant to accomplish and what the Supreme Court did with it, as Kim said. How the... much time do I have? <laughs> Give me 90 seconds. Right, because I want us to, you know, have you know have have a robust uh, conversation? Yes. Yes. Now give us the overview. Uh, certainly, the the overview is that uh, the Voting Rights Act is, uh, I think, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan called the crown jewel, right? Uh, so uh, it is one of one of the most monumental pieces of legislation ever passed by Congress, and had a uh, a, a a a monumental impact on the right to vote. Of uh, particularly for African Americans, I say when I speak to people on voting rights, uh, African Americans have been in the United States for 400 years. We've only been voting for 55. 
Let that sink you know, in. Right. I mean, uh, the, 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 the Civil War did not solve this problem. It took the fifty-five Civil years, and it would. And if you turn to in my book, in, in, in my book, I uh, detail about certainly the, the the ebbs and flows of having uh, being allowed access, and then having that. Uh, taken away in very short order, particularly after Reconstruction, and we're seeing the same right. type of cycle here. Uh, certainly after uh, so, so, so I take it that one of the key uh, reforms, one of the key elements of the Voting Rights Act, was to require the Justice Department to approve, in a, in a clearance process, changes to voting procedures in certain jurisdictions. And what did the Supreme Court do in the Shelby County case? Well, in the Shelby County decision, so the Voting Rights Act has some key provisions, uh, certainly in 1965, those two of those primary provisions were Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which certainly outlaws or prohibits uh, 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 discrimination based on race and language uh, for the entire nation. And then you had Section 5, which only uh, applied to certain jurisdictions, which primarily were those years where, where Southern states, right? Uh, Louisiana, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Louisiana, Texas, North Carolina, South Carolina, et cetera. And in those states where there was a, uh, uh, a disenfranchising mechanism, like a literacy test or a poll tax uh, prior to November 1965, um, and, and, and that less than 50% of the uh, eligible persons were registered to, registered to vote, those, those were the covered jurisdictions. And if you were a covered jurisdiction, then you had to submit any voting change whether it was a whether it was moving a polling place across the street or a congressional redistricting, anything that affected the right to vote had to be pre-cleared or approved by the attorney general uh, or the United States District Court for the District of Columbia. And certainly, you know, while I was at the Department of Justice as a deputy chief in the Civil Rights Division voting section, on average, the Department of Justice uh, received about. Uh, 5,000 submissions. So that, 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 and that did not account for the number of changes that was contained in each submission. Mm -hmm. Certainly for the decennial years of when, when redistricting occurred, that, that number increased tremendously. Uh, but of those, so just think about that's 5,000 changes that are occurring just in those 11 or so states that were covered under the uh, United States. And we provided notice for, for, uh, for, for people in communities that, hey, a change is happening and the Department of Justice is determining whether or not this change would put uh, voters of color in a worse position. And if it right. did, if it retrogressed, then that change would not be approved and the jurisdiction could not uh, implement it. But now we're seeing because of Shelby County, there is no Section 5 and jurisdictions are, 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 are implementing these changes without uh, the vetting of, of, of some other authority and particularly of the federal government. Places in other that are impacting. Written by Chief Justice Roberts. So a moment ago we were all proud of him and these other decisions, but uh, he certainly was not a friend of uh, voting rights in this decision. Now he did say that Congress could come back and fix the formula determining which jurisdictions would be subject. Jennifer or Kim or anybody, is there any possibility that this Congress is going to fix the Voting Rights Act? I, my understanding, there is legislation pending, right? Um, uh, pending. Yeah, there is. Legislation so, pending. I mean. I, I think what's really important to underscore with respect to the Voting Rights Act was, uh, and this is a separation of powers issue, which is one of my my loves. So, um, in the Congress, not only passed that statute, but the but overwhelmingly renewed it multiple times. And the Supreme Court, a conservative court, came in and basically said, "Nope, we don't like this legislation for this technical reason." And so, you ask yourself, what is the role of the Supreme Court? I mean, you've got overwhelming support in the Congress, representatives of the United States for this, and even uh, the majority admitted it was extraordinarily successful. Uh, in terms of addressing systemic racism at the polls. So, so the Congress has so much on its plate and we have a Senate Majority Leader who is basically acting as um, a block to a lot of important legislation that, that bipartisan majorities of the United of Americans want uh, gun control immigration reform health care he doesn't he doesn't bring it to the floor and so it's really hard with this dysfunctional Congress to see the kinds of changes um, and going back to the original comment about DACA Justice Kavanaugh and the other dissenters were really upset with the fact it wasn't so much I think Justice Kavanaugh was more Justice Thomas that Congress hasn't done this well why why should the court be be construing language that it's really up to Congress, the same thing with the definition of sex under the title, title seven. Well, let Congress do its job, first of all, 
Uh, second of all, Congress isn't doing its job, and that's in part because mm -hmm. of the polarization that's just stalling legislation well, like this. Specifically on election uh, procedures, there's legislation to help the states do this. Gilda and, and Jennifer were talking about ways in which the states need to be acting, you said it, Kim, to prepare for uh, November, and uh, legislation to provide funding for that has been blocked in, in the Senate. Um, let me, I want to bring another audience question in. I do encourage our audience members to, uh, to ask questions. Um, uh, and it, it's the issue of um, felon disenfranchisement, which I was going to get to anyway, but our audience member gets us there. We're asked, I'd be interested to hear thoughts on those convicted of felonies not being able to vote. When did this first come about? And do you anticipate voting rights being restored to felons with the current protests? Is that one of the issues that's going to be addressed through the current um, uh, demonstrations? Jennifer, this is something that your organization has worked on in Florida and elsewhere. Tell us how you see the felon disenfranchisement issue. Well, I can talk about this a little bit. I know that Professor Daniels' um, advancement project has been working on this in Florida, um, but it, it honestly varies from state to state because every state has its own, um, its own rules as to you know, whether folks who are uh, returning citizens will be able to um, have their rights restored and at what point their rights will be restored. Um, in some states, it is automatically, as soon as you have completed um, your um, sentence, whatever that is, it will be, your, your rights will be restored automatically. In other states, um, that sentence also includes um, probation or parole. Um, in other places, like Florida, as we have seen with Amendment 4, um, you know, that also includes your uh, restitution and fines and fees, and that would need to be paid. So it varies from state to state. Um, with what's happening with the protest, I don't know if those are things that will necessarily be addressed um, because there's so much focus, I think, on COVID right now in the legislature and a lot of states have had emergency sessions to um, address specific issues and even the issues that are related to COVID are not always fully focused on voting. They're related to other issues outside of voting. I don't know that felon disenfranchisement is necessarily at the forefront of legislators' minds. Mm -hmm. um, it certainly needs to be, um, well, but I don't Florida. know that it will be you know, right. that it's where it needs to be at. Sorry to interrupt, but um, Florida did have, you know, it, it was a, a ballot measure that passed that seemed to expand mm -hmm. uh, felon voting, ex-felons, returning citizens voting, uh, and the governor uh, put some impediments there. Gilda, do you want to talk about how you see the Florida litigation and the current status in Florida? Let Absolutely, but before we get to the Florida litigation, what the question yeah. also asked, how did this come about? How did felon disenfranchisement laws come about? Yes, yes, go back, please. And certainly after, after, so after uh, Reconstruction, uh, when uh, post-Reconstruction, when states were trying to re-enter the Union, they had to have constitutional conventions. And in these constitutional conventions, um, Southern, and part of the Southern strategy certainly was that they would implement these laws that would certainly eliminate uh, blacks from the voting rolls. And they said, they admitted that they were going to, that they, that, that was their intent. And they inc included things like poll taxes, literacy tests, and felon disenfranchisement. So you had in places like Mississippi during their constitutional convention, which was in the early 1900s, they said, we're, let's determine which of these, which uh, uh, which uh, crimes do blacks generally commit? And in, and in looking at and determining what they believe those crimes to be, they used uh, wife beating and timber theft as disenfranchising crimes, but not rape or murder. And so they use that as a way of getting rid of blacks uh, from, from the voting rolls. Fast forward to 2020, where in a place like Florida, you have 1.3 million people, or sorry, 2018, you have 1.3 million people in the state of Florida who are disenfranchised because of previous, con previous felony convictions. One in three of those persons are African-American, right? And so the, 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 although the, the, certainly the, the laws might have changed, uh, or, the, or, or even the disenfranchising felonies, the impact was the same, the effect was the same, that it was a, used as a tool to disenfranchise African-Americans. And what um, 
what the, the Desmond Meads group FRC did was put this about, put this on, put this to the people of Florida to say, is this right? Should we continue this? Right? Should we continue to disenfranchise people for having a suspended license? And right? the majority of the voters said no. They said we the majority of 64% of the voters said no. And now and, the governor, and, it seems to be slowing it down. Will the courts give life to the voters' intent here to, to broaden? Well, this is a sec the second opinion from, but we had a federal district court opinion. It went up to the Court of Appeals, back to the federal district court. And in the last month or so, the federal district court said that this, um, the, that, in, that requiring previously convicted persons to complete payment of all their fines, fees, and restitution before they can register to vote was the equivalent of a poll tax and unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. That the, 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 the uh, governor is deciding whether or not he's going to appeal uh, that decision. He only, I think, has a few days left before he can make that decision. Uh, but certainly we're hopeful that uh, those, those that, you know, more than a million people could certainly uh, regain the right to vote uh, because of the efforts of, 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 of grassroots organizations um, to to bring it to the attention of uh, the, the, the uh, citizens of Florida. I'll just editorialize here for a second. The, the felon disenfranchisement issue is both an election law issue and, and a right to vote issue, but it also goes to over-criminalization. As you say, millions of people are, are barred from uh, because of uh, convictions. You wonder whether the criminal law is being applied uh, too, uh, too widely and in a discriminatory fashion, which is, Jennifer, to the point of some of these protests. Uh, as we seek to, to achieve. Mm -hmm. Let me just add to, uh, as a constitutional sure, yeah. matter, there aren't other yeah. rights that go away um, in this way. Like you don't lose your First Amendment rights. You don't lose your due process rights. Uh, you don't you don't even um, use your right to be protected against cruel and unusual punishment, although we can debate whether that's properly interpreted when we've got the death penalty. Um, as I agree with Gilda, what she said at the top, that it's, it's the linchpin of all the other rights, whatever you care about. If you don't have the ability to go to the polls and vote, then those rights don't mean anything. Your voice doesn't matter. And, and for whatever reason, it's sort of this optional thing that depends on your zip code. And remember, George Bush was put in office for eight years with 537 votes in Florida. So this disenfranchised of felons is a really significant uh, thing in terms of shifting the dynamic and taking power away from where it's been entrenched for, since the beginning of this country um, and more fairly distributing it. I mean, one of the things that shocked me when, frankly, when I wrote this book is because we think a lot about the right to vote, um, but there is really an undercurrent that starts from the beginning. I mean, it's a, it's a, it comes out of slavery that, that it, only the right people with the right to vote should be able to vote. <laughs> and the rights don't discriminate that way. That's in the 14th Amendment. But when it comes to voting, this is one of those things. There is at least one state, and you can correct me, I think it's Vermont, that even people in jail uh, can vote while they're in jail. And if they pay their debt to society and a judge issues their sentence, I mean, we can talk about the fairness of that, why they should be disenfranchised for, for the rest of their lives. It's, it's anti-constitutional in a way that you don't see with other rights. Good, yeah. Um, let's take another question from the audience. Um, this takes us in a different direction, but Kim, you'll be well suited to answer this. Any thoughts on foreign interference in our elections through social media? Will our elections be secure? I mean, uh, we have a doubt about how it went four years ago as we look to November this year. Uh, is foreign interference going to be a, an issue? Well, I mean, both you know, Robert Mueller passionately testified um, when he talked about his report and basically said it's an urgent issue, Congress needs to address it immediately, that it's ongoing. And this isn't just in the last few years. You know, the Russians have been trying to infiltrate the election system by dividing dividing Americans against each other to break democracy in that way for, for, for decades. Um, and, you know, former Deputy Attorney General and a friend of UB, Rod Rosenstein, has passionately uh, made the, the argument that Russian interference is real and it's ongoing. And Mitch McConnell, are, uh, once again, is, has stalled legislation, vibrant legislation. There's been some that's gone through, uh, but I don't think uh, by any measure the kind of uh, attention to this has been placed by the federal government and Congress. So I think there's pretty 
pretty much 100% chance that there is going to be attempts. And I want to, glad this was raised because oftentimes the, what people say about this is, well, there's no hacking of the machines. It didn't actually change any vote, so who cares? Um, first of all, I think there's some ambiguity and that as a factual matter. And the fact that we have so many different state systems and even local systems is kind of a protection against a massive hack. Um, but basically the way this works is putting information in your phone um, you know, they are, they did hack, you know, the DNC, et cetera. They're hacking, you know, taking emails and things, but they're also planting lies in people's personal feeds that are mis that basically distort or dupe you into either not voting at all or voting in ways that are against your own interests based on false information. Someone pops up in your Facebook feed that purports to live in your neighborhood and is Joe Schmo with his kids at the baseball game and tells you these things about candidates, tells you these things about races that aren't true. This is really, really corrosive to America, to American democracy. And the framers of the constitution understood this. It's why we have a republic and not a direct democracy because they were afraid about the, you know, false propaganda spreading and people making decisions against their interests. So it's quite, quite corrosive, I think in this moment, the antidote is to understand that it's real um, and to protect yourself by going to original sources, secretaries of state, people's websites that are running for office to get actual firsthand information that's accurate. That's good. You know, we're going to be talking about disinformation and this kind of uh, uh, swirl of misinformation uh, in an upcoming webinar. So stay tuned for that. Let's turn to something else. You know, uh, we talk about the right to vote and, and, and how important it is for people to vote. You can kind of get... Uh, Disillusion because does it really matter if in 2016 three million more Americans voted for Hillary Clinton than voted for Donald Trump, but he's president? And as we mentioned in 2000, uh, more Americans voted for Al Gore than voted for George W. Bush. Does the Electoral College fundamentally distort uh, democracy? Gilda, um, I mean, uh, what, what is this Electoral College and what do we need it for? Uh, that's that's certainly a question that that people are asking in regards to certainly whether or not it's whether or not it's it's still uh, relevant or still needed uh, in in t in today's of ways of of electing. So Back in the day, for two hundred years ago, we were worried. Well, it's a big country; not everybody would get information about the candidates. But today, everybody knows every minute what the candidates are saying, what they stand for. Why do we? It shouldn't I mean, shouldn't there be a serious effort to uh, to go to more direct democracy? Well, there is. Well, certainly, the, the, there are states that are moving towards the national popular vote, and Maryland is one of those states that's saying that you know whatever the popular vote is, that's what the, that's where the their uh, electoral college votes will be cast. And this would be a compact um, among states, so that we, all the states that sign on to this would agree that that's how they. Yeah. You're, we're gonna have to, you have, we'll have to change the fundamental way in which we elect the president, right, in regards to uh, uh, moving from the electoral college to a national popular vote uh, process. And I don't, to be honest, I don't necessarily see that happening or certainly in the ways in which it, um, in the ways in which it would happen. And certainly I get this, the electoral, this electoral college uh, question um, all the time. And I, I tell people that, you know, the important, certainly the right to vote is important. And if, if, if you're only looking at whether or not the right to vote is important based on the presidential election, then I think that's, I think, I think that's, I think that's a mistake. I think we have to look at the right to vote in regards to the ability to vote in all elections, uh, including the presidential election. Um, and I think, you know, the, the uh, electing, the way in which we elect the president is, uh, uh, is it today is certainly the electoral college, and I think it's important that you know the more people uh, cast ballots and lift their voices, the more representative, I guess, the electoral college will be in that in that regard. Yeah, I mean, another you talk about uh, congressional elections, not the presidential, but congressional elections. You have kind of the uh, the, the uh, looming specter of gerrymandering, where elected officials are choosing their voters um, instead of the other way around. And that maybe has the effect of discouraging people from voting because it's decided already. I'm in a Republican district or I'm in a Democratic district. What difference does it make? Jennifer, is that something that you've thought about? Um, is, is there a, a way we should be fighting gerrymandering? Yeah, I mean, this is definitely an issue that Lawyers Committee um, has been um, filing litigation on for quite some time. And I think particularly as we are, you know, 2020 is a very interesting year because we have the presidential election taking place. It's also a census year. 
and then we're getting ready for the redistricting cycle, um, which has been delayed to a certain extent because of COVID. Um, so a lot is happening right now, getting ready for the redistricting cycle. Um, so this is something that Lawyers Committee has given a lot of thought to preparing for 2021, but also things that we have worked on um, a lot in the last decade. Um, and it does present a, a huge issue. I think um, North Carolina is a really uh, interesting example of that. Um, and going back to the you know, conversation about voter ID, um, you know, when that was struck down at the end of last year um, in Judge Biggs' um, decision, she talked about, you know, kind of outlined the history over time in North Carolina and all of the things that led to voter ID um, being put on the ballot as a constitutional amendment. And gerrymandering was a part of that. So I think yeah. it's important kind of in a, in a larger context for people to think about, um, you know, what it means when you have these these districts that are, you know, a, as we say as uh, voting rights experts, packed or cracked, where you know you're either adding in certain kinds of voters because you want your district to look a certain way, or you're taking out certain voters, also for the same reasons, um, and and that presents a huge problem because it it does impact whether people will participate because they know, okay, this is a largely, you know, Republican district, mm -hmm. this might not be my particular leanings, and I might not be interested in voting in this particular election. So and it, I think, it, Jennifer, it Renee, yes, it, we should acknowledge that uh, here in Maryland, in our state, uh, there's serious gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court looked at that and didn't remedy it, but they're a Democratic legislature yeah. and a Democratic governor packed it so that Republicans only have one seat in the congressional delegation, whereas their mm -hmm. population you know, statistically, would call for more. Um, if, I want to, we're almost done. Um, again, uh, I know audience questions in these last minutes, but Kim, I'm going to paraphrase a question that came, you know, with mail and voting, we might not know the result on election night uh, for a couple of days. And what happens if the president, as he's been wont to do, both in 2016 and more recently, questions the legitimacy of the election? Are we in danger of having uncertainty as to who won? And a you know a segment of the country doubting uh, that the election was free and fair. Uh, how are we going to deal with that as a country? Well, I think the immediate best case scenario is that there's a tsunami uh, and not a trickle of civic engagement because the times where the electoral college won the day over the popular vote, the the vote. The, st the spread, the delta was very narrow. So, so if it's a big delta, there's going to be less of a question about the legitimacy when you talk about George Bush 537 votes. Uh, if you're talking millions of voters um, like Barack Obama won, then it's harder. That being said, with this particular president and how we saw um, things unfold in front of the White House in connection with the First Amendment demonstrations after the murder of George Floyd and his attempt to use uh, un unmarked police officers or use of, of federal agents that didn't have any identification, as well as uh, various states, national guards, um, whether there will be some violence around the cry for him uh, to not leave office or his uh, potential argument that, that it's an illegitimate election. I mean, nothing is off the table with this particular person who's in office. And so I do think that that is something uh, that is serious, but more serious to think about later. Right now, um, if it gets people to, to, to the extent to which they can, I'm very sorry to hear from Gilda. I didn't know that, that uh, online voting was, was disenfranchising people that are disenfranchised in person um, and they don't have an option. That's really, really very sad because of course uh, in, uh, registration's gone down with COVID as was mentioned earlier. Um, but now is the time for everyone to take this as their job, uh, as, as important as anything else you've done in your life. And that's not just to get yourself up registered, but to get other people, one person. If you think about less than 50% of the uh, eligible population voting in any election, if that number is 60, 70, 80, 90%, um, that 
that then that we will change the outcome of these things uh, and hopefully uh, drown out some of the voices of big money, dark money, corporate money, and these other the uh, gerrymandering, all of these things. Uh, uh, this is the way, and our former President Obama has said this, this is the only tool left in the American toolbox for democracy. This is not a luxury. It's not an option. It's an obligation. I tweet all the time, vote for your vote for life. Uh, and it's a bipartisan thing. It's not blue or red. It's it's America. And so I think that's really the answer, Ron, was, first. And then we see how it goes. That, that, you, that you just made your closing remarks, Kim. That was beautiful and, and, and very well said, very eloquent. I'm going to give Gilda and then Jennifer a chance to, to wrap up. And basically, I want to ask you, Gilda, are you optimistic or pessimistic about uh, the state of uh, the election? Are we going to have a free and fair election uh, this November? Uh, I, am, I am optimistic. I think that uh, COVID is well as the current state of uh, the United States gives us an opportunity to make some changes. Uh, you see those changes and, and, and to the extent that uh, advocacy groups are trying to force those changes through litigation, that's, if that's the way it's going to occur, then that's certainly the tools that we're, we're uh, willing to use. So I'm optimistic that we, can, that we can certainly use this as an opportunity to make the changes that we need to ensure that we have a free, fair, and non-discriminatory path to the uh, voting booth. I say in my book, right, we, we have to fight to vote for the right to vote. And uh, there are you know, those of us who are ready uh, and equipped uh, for the battle and uh, to ensure that uh, everybody has the, has the right to vote. Um, and Jennifer, my question for you, my closing question for you is this. Um, you're a young person, younger than me, certainly. Um, are young people committed to this democracy? Are we going to see the kind of turnout among younger Americans uh, that's going to uh, kind of revive democracy in America? Or is, are we a, a democracy that's in danger of kind of uh, petering out? I think so. I think that um, for the critique that young people are disillusioned, um, honestly, I think that's a myth. Um, we are all very concerned about our futures. We are also very concerned about our immediate present and what that looks like. Um, you know, whether we are safe in our homes, like Brianna Taylor, who's from my hometown of Louisville, Kentucky, um, you know, what our economic safety and security looks like, um, and, you know, just what our, what our world looks like. Um, these are things that young people and people who are even younger than I am um, are very seriously concerned about. Um, so I think for those of us who are of voting age and who are eligible to vote, I think this is very much at the forefront of our minds. Um, I think all of us are trying to figure out how with COVID we are able to um, be able to register and get others registered and be able to participate in our democracy. But I absolutely think that this is something that we are all very concerned about um, and committed in our own ways to feel the conditions of our own communities in, um, around us um, and, and our society overall. That's great. And Jennifer, it's so inspiring to have you uh, we're so proud of you as a recent UB law grad in this field and, and, and diving into this, uh, this fight in such a great way. So I want to thank our audience members and thank our panelists uh, for all being with us. I want to ask everybody to do three things, three things. Number one, I want you to buy Kim Whaley's book, <laughs> What You Need to Know About Voting and Why, and read that book. Then I want you to buy Gilda Daniels' book, Uncounted, The Crisis of Voter Suppression in America, and read that book. And then I want everybody to vote on November 3rd. Uh, these panelists are writing about and advocating and fighting for your right to vote. And there have been people who have died for your right to vote. Let's take advantage of it. And whether it's by mail or in person or on a computer screen or with a number two pencil, exercise your right to vote. We all must do that, please. So thank you all, uh, panelists. Thank you, audience members. And join us again on July 14th for our next discussion about redlining as part of our our um, series on structural racism in America. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you. Thank you.